It's times like this when the power and the value of STEM learning ecosystems community of practice becomes very visible. Presented by STEM at Home, an initiative launched by the STEM Learning Ecosystems Community of Practice, STEM Community Conversations is a series of conversations for teachers, school officials, community leaders, and the many others impacted by school closures and virtual learning. For those of you new to this initiative, the STEM Ecosystems, operated by TIES, which you can find at stemecosystems.org, harness the power of business and industry, funders and foundations, K-12 school, higher education, and more to find solutions to common problems and to build thriving communities. Embracing the ecosystem way, these gatherings will provide a space and time for leaders to share common challenges, ideas, and resources. Conversations will revolve around successful models and new ideas to support STEM learning experiences during and beyond this time of social distancing. These are interactive conversations where you will have the opportunity to ask your questions to our experts. So make sure to enter your questions by clicking that little Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, where you can also upvote the questions asked by others. Thank you for joining us today. I'm, uh, I'm wearing my, my CBGB's shirt because we have an educational rock star with us. Um, in 2013, Megan Kinsey, Tom Dwyer, and I were charged by our superintendent to completely rethink what learning looked like for our school district in Menor, Ohio. And one of the first people we contracted with to help us uh, was my friend Charity Allen, who was working at the time for the Buck Institute, training and writing those PVL rubrics you've all used. And we were in a sort of brainstorming session, and I was talking at length about a different educational thought leader who everyone uh, was kind of into at the time. Well, Charity said, yeah, he's okay, but have you heard of Yang Zhao? And I said, I hadn't. And she said, you need to. What makes him different than all of those other people who can speak so perfectly about the problems in education is that Dr. Zhao then moves on to actually talking about solutions. That led me down a rabbit hole of books and blogs and bringing Dr. Zhao to the City Club of Cleveland to talk to the educators in my region. Dr. Zhao talks about solutions. Well, what we need today during this pandemic are solutions and not just solutions for how to reach our students now, but lessons that we can learn from today's crisis that can change and impact education moving forward. It's my belief and the belief of ties that traditional schooling has been obsolete for some time, uh, but that's never been more apparent than these first several months of 2020. Who can help us with the path forward? I can't think of anyone better than Dr. Yang Zhao. Yang Zhao's foundation's distinguished professor in the School of Education at the University of Kansas with a joint appointment as a professor of educational leadership at Melbourne Graduate Col uh, School of Education in Australia. Prior to joining University of Kansas, he served as the presidential chair, director of the Institute for Global and Online Education and associate dean in the College of Education, University of Oregon, where he's also a professor in the Department of Educational Measurement Policy and Leadership. Until December 2010, Zhao was University Distinguished professor, the, uh, professor at the College of Education, Michigan State University. He's published over 100 articles and over 30 books and has received numerous awards and honors, including the Early Career Award from the American Educational Research Association, the Outstanding Public Educator from the Horace Mann in, uh, League of USA, and Distinguished Achievement Award in Professional Development from the Association of Education Publishers. He's an elected fellow of the International Academy of Education and the National Academy of Education. Remember, you can begin asking your questions now and upvoting other questions by pressing that Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Dr. Zhao, we are, uh, we're in the midst of a generation-defining crisis. What's next? Well, thanks, Jeremy. It's great to see you. and. Uh... Uh, thanks for actually uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, have a chance to chat, have a conversation with uh, so many people interested in in this. And uh, I'm I'm surprised how many participants you've got. I guess most people are are bored in some way. I guess, and so they are looking for some kind of entertainment. Uh, and I'm not sure I can provide that much, but I will I will really raise some questions. I really hope this is a conversation. And a lot of the things you know I talk about, you know. I used to talk about, I continue to talk about, I will be talking about, and also uh, some of the ideas show up in my writings, in, on my blog, in different places. And uh, so I, I think I'm gonna really talk about four or five things and mostly raise as questions. I think the number one is that, uh, which may not apply to your uh, community, but does apply to many other places, is that uh, how do you really uh, make good use of the crisis that, uh, of the crisis we have, you know? Uh, that is the opportunity we have. I, I won't really highlight the opportunities. I, I really do not want all the economic downturns, all the unfortunate death and unfortunate sickness to go on 
I mean, to go unwasted. You know, right now, it's that a lot of times we, we see the great human tragedy and the, the huge disruption. We have a lot of norms shattered and you know, all those kind of things. You know, we have to rethink. I really want to invite all of us to, to think big. Uh, big in, enough to say we, we are really trying to transform something here, not just to think about you know, uh, what we used to have and uh, let's not return to the same education you know, when we return to the same school. That's my, my mantra, I think. Uh, not the same education, you know, even though we return to the same school. Let's not call that normal, you know, let's return to the normal. That's not normal. As you said before, you know, uh, we have, uh, as you know, said, the education we have now is obsolete. We have run into the education crisis, you know, for long enough, but the crisis lasted long and slow and nobody felt it. And suddenly this is the opportunity that shines a spotlight on the crisis we have. You know, if, for example, what, what the crisis we have. Number one, I think that the big crisis is that uh, uh, the lack of a, a global understanding. And I see right now and our children uh, um, are not educating right now with call citizens. You know, so you look at what's happening right now, facing this huge human tragedy, the pandemic, we still see rising xenophobia, racism, isolationism, protectionism, and nationalism, and, and uh, everybody become very selfish. You know, I have no problem with people being self-interested, but short-sighted selfishness actually defeats all of us. And if you look at, even in the United States, you look at all the, the different states, the federal government against state government, and all those kind of things is that it's us versus them. I think that's, that's, a, that's really a missing point because right now, I mean, I know you are, you know, in the STEM ecosystem and other people, I think uh, STEM has to have a heart. That is human beings have to learn how to live together peacefully, how to share prosperity. You know, the human interdependency is key. I think that's a big crisis. And I blame that crisis, honestly, in our traditional education. Our traditional education makes people selfish makes people compete for the better test scores, you know, the, uh, the uh, test scores on SAT and SAT so you can go to better colleges. Look at the slogan we have in our, this I generation, our kids, we say, well, you, you want to study hard, you want to get good grades so you can go to better college and get better life. But what about others? What about other people? I think there is a big problem we don't understand is that when we do that, we are really trying to build our success upon other people's failure. You know, the SAT is a, is a perfect example. It's, it's a percentile score, basically. In order for you to be good, someone has to be worse than you. And that's what, you know, sometimes I joke about this, you know, you don't really have to study hard. You just have to make other people worse than you. Then you'll get better scores to go to college. It's, uh, so I think that the first issue, the crisis is, how do we help each and every child to become unique and great? and then build, translate that greatness, that uniqueness into something valuable for others. Here's what you were talking about, about solution. I think the solution is that our children has to learn how to become unique, but that uniqueness can only be valuable when it's of value to other people. You realize your value by creating value for others. That's human interdependency. So that's the biggest crisis right now. I think, think about how do we break away from the traditional curriculum, traditional testing, because so far we have all been controlled by this manufactured scarcity called college, called a, a, a pyramids of opportunities. We're distributing that one. I think that's a lot of times uh, our parents, our educators, our business people, are unwilling to move away from the curriculum, from testing, because we are being judged will be selected by those predefined curriculum standards testing and or at least so we think but actually the opportunity is right there you know we don't need all of those things i think this pandemic may cause the closure of so many different institutions may remove so many barriers so let's think about what has been removed right so far at least temporarily all the standardized tests are being at this temporary suspended we're not doing any of those things Many colleges, universities have already decided, had already decided before the pandemic to drop test scores, use test scores to judge. And now an increasing number of them have decided not, not to use test scores to judge students. 
And so I think that the, the selection criteria is removing, but also another big piece, I don't think many people recognize this, higher education is in crisis. After this pandemic, that we may realize you actually can deliver a decent part of education through online, through distributed. You know, while many people have tried this, have practiced this, but this may push people off the cliff a little bit. I don't mean college education is simply about acquiring knowledge. I would be the last person to, to say that. I think learning to socialize, learning to hang out, learning to the social capital, cultural capital is important. Uh, don't get me wrong, but at least partly what the higher education, you know, we used to have the MOOCs, you know, and now we're going to see em emphasis a lot more of those. So let's recognize that we have a rare opportunity to rethink about how do we deal with unique human beings and the uniqueness becoming valuable through creating value for others. That's what I call creativity and entrepreneurship education. So that's, and, and that has to happen on a global scale. No one can truly be the lonely rich man on the block. Everybody has to come together to think about equity, to think about others happy together. So that's really, I think, the, the, the first crisis we, we've had. Another thing I think is, uh, you know, crisis is that um, we've been criticizing the one size fits all education model for I don't know how, however long, you know, that, that has been. We want, to be child, we want it to be child centered. We want to meet the needs of every student. We want to support every student. But yet, you look at our school, we're still bound by the traditional grammar of schooling. The traditional grammar of schooling, that is we chunk our, uh, our knowledge into 45 minutes or 40 minutes chunks. We have one adult teaching like 20, 30, 40 kids. That's why we kept debating, the arg we kept arguing about does class size matter, you know, and we never get a final conclusion. Then you have uh, also every learning, even though we say, well, we should be global, we still isolate learning inside the classroom walls, you know, in those things. But now maybe it's time to break that. You know, I know many schools have been trying to replicate, replicate schooling when kids are at home. And it has not worked. You know, we just pretend to do that. It uh, tires the teachers out. It tires the students out. And it's, it add, added unnecessary anxiety and stress to, to students and uh, to teachers. So I think that's another thing we can break it. Why do we have to chunk it? Why do we have to start school at a certain time? Why do we have to have one student, you know, all students arranged by age group, by their, you know, their, uh, their um, chronological age? You know, why can't we regroup them? You know, that's why I think schools have to rethink about, do we have to teach the way we used to teach? Do we have to organize learning that we used to uh, organize? And this is another great time to rethink. And after rethinking, let's not return. Let's not return to the old, old places. So, so ask ourselves, can we regroup ourselves? Can we rearrange the so-called curriculum? Can we, uh, as teachers, work together? Can we really, uh, can we not cross boundaries, cross institutional boundaries, geographic boundaries to deliver good education for all of us? The, a lot of times this may sound naive, but all the institutions we have built were once built by men and women. And they can be undone, and they can be. This might be the time for us to finally, you know, say goodbye to the grammar of schooling that has constrained our imagination and creativity for a long time, for a very long time. And the third one is I, I you know, what I'm trying to write right now is that um, how do we acknowledge the arrival of the digital world? We don't know what to do. You know, you look at uh, the, the the research about uh, about kids. We we're scared of children get on screen time, you know. And many schools, you know, institute uh, cell phone bans, you know, smartphone bans, and uh, uh, pediatrician asso association advise parents to restrict access to cell phones, smart devices, and all those things. And uh, the internet, uh, the social media are dangerous, are causing anxiety, are causing all those kind of issues. Yes, indeed, that's probably true. But some people benefit from that. Some people do a lot of those things. I think that has to do with our education. You know, we do have a, a new world, but how has schools dealt with that? 
I don't think, you know, not, I don't think much. Actually, we teach technology courses. We teach information literacy. We sometimes even teach called digital literacy. We teach media arts. But have we ever devoted as much time to helping our children to learn to live, to socialize, to learn in this new environment? We, you know, banning it won't help. But this is a great opportunity. Like, you know, many countries, uh, France, for example, China, use, as a country, used to ban you know, uh, cell phone uh, or devices for all students. But now they have to give it back to them. And a consequence I know in China is that uh, children sadly because they were so unprepared, they don't know how to manage their devices. They don't know how to use it smartly. They don't know how to use it wisely or productively. This is the time maybe to help our children learn. We have a new world called a digital world. Let's learn to be good participants, to be productive citizens, to socialize, to do all of this. And this has a lot to do, a lot more than simply more than simply the skills to use, or more than simply managing your, your devices. And let's rethink about that piece. This is a great time to do this. And the final point is, um, is I think, you know, in schools, traditional schools, another crisis we used to have traditional schools, or the conflict, I would say, between student agency and the control of the curriculum of the testing. I think in a new way, we will be advocating for student agency self-determination, the right to self-determination, uh, a student voice for a long time again. But because of the traditional grammar of schooling, it's really hard for students to exercise their, their rights to self-determination, to determine how they want to learn, when they want to learn, what they want to learn, and with whom they want to learn. And all of that, you know, you know if we want children to become self-determined citizens, to become self-responsible citizens, to become owners of their own learning, owners of their own action. The only way to help them is to facilitate their growth in authentic experiences. It's not a lesson, it's not a, you know, a direct instruction. So why don't we right now, since students are so distributed, think about relinquishing some of our control to make use students as change partners. Our students can create value for other students. Our students can become organizers. As educators, we don't have to do that. I hope this will start a new youth movement, a movement to understand that we can actually get our children to be self-determined learners, to have the self, uh, you know, the, the, the agency to be of value for others. To summarize, and let me just give you an example. Uh, I welcome this. This is a little commercial what I'm trying to give you is that I have started a, a project, not announced yet, it's called HIP, H-I-P, Human Interdependency Project. I'm trying to create a movement, like a, I'm trying to create a hipster network of young ch of students who are willing to learn, to create value for others, at the same time improving their uniqueness and greatness. And this idea is, is that, you know, you will create value by serving students in other countries in other locations. And we're gonna also create an entrepreneurship course around HIP. HIP is called entrepreneurship course, then called a social entrepreneurship. It is based on my view of education. I, you know, we start with a, a problem worth solving. That's other people's problem you wanna solve. That's how you create value. And then we go through this, you know, product oriented learning. That is every time, every learning starts with your idea to solve an authentic problem. I saw like, you know, I was tweeting this, John Sandy Brown's talking about, you know, that you know, new age learners should be able to sense a decent pro uh, you know, uh, problem, very interesting problem, and trying to come up with an elegant solution and be engaged in productive increase. So that's what the whole HIP project is. If you're interested, I may write something about this later. So I want to end there and I want to say, okay, this is a crisis. Let's not waste it. In every crisis lies great opportunities. With all the traditional things, the traditional obstacles of education are removed at least temporarily for us. What can we do to reimagine an education? And more important, can we build enough new institutions? And so when we return to the tradition or the traditional place, that we are bringing back a new education experience that cannot be undone. Thank you, Jeremy.
Thank you. That, that really gives us a lot to think about. I, I know we talk a lot about how um, in education about how we need our students to have more agency and to stick with problems and figure them out and learn how to research. But then we have a tendency to uh, not allow them uh, to access their devices and to tell them exactly what the answer is and ask them to spit it back out. Um, so it's a, you know, we kind of add to this problem that we also complain about. And I, I think you're right that this is kind of a, a rare opportunity for us to, to really take a step back and when we come back um, to, to rebuild. Um, in a second, I'm going to ask, and I, I apologize if I'm about to um, terribly mess up this name, um, but I'm gonna ask uh, Taufik Naji um, to ask um, their question. Um, so we'll unmute you in a second. Um, but first, I wanted to, to ask this. Um, we at, at TIES are of the very deep belief that one way to shift education to be deeper and more meaningful is to focus on grand challenges, those problems that actually impact not just communities at large, but the communities local and global where students live. What might it look like to have students address this pandemic now um, remotely or when they're, they're back in school? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, this is a, a great question and a great example. How can we start it? It's, I think, you know, I'm very, you know, as part of the HIV project, uh, we are going to launch um, a global virtual summer camp. And one of the things is for students to explore the different lives under COVID-19. And they will be producing either interviews with the families or, or videos to talk about this at the common ideas. They, they, there's a lot of things they can explore about human interdependency. They can talk about the, from a scientific perspective, how germs spread, you know, how get, we get infected. And then from a, um, a historical perspective, they can go back to multiple human disasters, you know, all, all those things. They can analyze the politics, they can analyze the technology, they can analyze a lot of things. And right now, actually, it wouldn't be a bad idea if your kids are at home to start having children to even collect photos, you know, uh, to publish a photo, uh, you know, photo collections of how lives, even with your own school. Your students can, 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 can explore the idea what the difference is. You remember we talked about real life learning. Now children are actually in the real world, living with different, uh, in, under different conditions to develop empathy, develop sympathy. But of course, I would encourage you to go beyond the local community. And some children may be very smart, come with different social distancing ideas, you know, the, you know with the same in the area to think about how technology maybe has facilitated the spread of the disease. Think about without technology, we might have been controlled better. You know, this may, so so you, you, about how technology is also going against that. In that, I said, you know, stem with the heart. That that is, uh, it's not you know, the stem with the heart is that understand the humanity of this. All these things, you know, when we invent them, they all have side effects. But how do you overcome that? I think this is a great project. We can get started just just exploring the various aspects of the global the pandemic. It is, again, an unfortunate global phenomenon that everybody has some experience with. This is rare, it's very rare. Actually, this is uh, some, but, but this, their reactions, the experiences may be different. And this also may help people to gain some cultural understandings. You know, like for example, for a long time, uh, the Chinese people never understood why Americans don't wear masks. You know, why, why they're, they're crazy. Well, they discover we have a president who doesn't like masks. Maybe that's the different reasons. But there are many other reasons you, you, you can think about, you know. And uh, wh why don't we do certain things? This is just a beautiful time to think about a common experience, but experienced differently in different locations, in different cultures, in different political systems, and, and also a, a problem that has so many different facets you can dive into. I can imagine, Jeremy, you know, this pandemic can be, honestly, the course topic to drive the rest of two years of, of, uh, of any curriculum. Then go with any curriculum, your literacy, your math, your science, your technology, your arts, you can all drive this. Something so big that you can drive deep learning but also connecting learning with others. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, um, I, I, I agree. I think this is um, such a rare opportunity. And, and I, I like what you said about, you know, we, there are other experiences that we've had kind of nationally that brought us together, but um, I, it, maybe I'm wrong, but it feels like this is the first time since, you know, maybe World War II um, that the entire world 
um, was really part of something together. And that gives us not only kind of the, the typical opportunity of breaking things down and rebuilding them, but also this shared experience, which is a bridge um, that hopefully can allow us to um, expand these opportunities beyond just our borders. Um, those of you listening, um, keep those questions coming in. I see lots of them coming in. You know, unfortunately, we're not going to have time to answer them all. Um, so we, we may kind of try to press Dr. Zhao to answer a couple more after this is, this is over in, in, his, uh, in his very small amounts of free time. But a way that you can help us in the interim is um, if you look on the questions, even if you don't have a question to ask, there's a little thumbs up symbol. So scan down, see if there are questions that, that kind of resonate with you. If you click that little thumbs up symbol, it rises it up and it'll help us dig into the questions that, uh, that more of you are, are asking. Um, so uh, for this next question, I'd like to, to go to, again, I apologize if I'm messing up your name, but Taufik, are you with us? Yes, I am. Uh, I go by Naji, by the way. Perfect, Naji. That's easier. Okay. Yeah, so uh, the question that I have is, I agree with you uh, regarding the over-reliance that uh, many of our societies seem to have uh, about, uh, you know, standard tasks, quote unquote, standard tasks. Um, but what do you propose, though, as a, as a replacement, you know, for these summative type of assessments? Uh, I'm, I'm just curious as to what are the things that you're looking at. For example, right now, I am trying to do away, for example, with my midterms, with my uh, final exams. But at the same time, uh, I'm just curious as to what things you would suggest. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Anaj. That, that's, uh, um, that's a common question. And uh, I think um, uh, it, I would, my answer is that, well, it really depends. Depends on your purpose. Is that, and I think right now you, you use term summative, uh, uh, for example. That means you want to certify the students has learned something to summarize, you know, in that regard. And, and uh, so I would typically try to use, if you want to use as a certified certain competency, probably portfolio, authentic products, probably, because that's going to be a, a different. And of course, if you, uh, if you accept the curriculum as defined, you know, I probably won't object to use standards, you know, uh, standardized testing. But, you know, for me, it just doesn't make sense. You know, uh, I, I'm a person look at holistically, like, you know, for example, um, standardized testing may, I think they are only really test your ability to take a standardized testing. That, that, that's, I don't think a test any more than that. Uh, but if that standardized test is accepted by society, if you want to get certain things, you know, uh, bypass that test, if that's kept you away from, you know, uh, access that report, I say you promise to have to do it. You know, that, that's what I, I think. But as a, as educator myself, I look at authentic products. I look at what you've created. You know, you know, you also in testing, we have, we also ask the question, you can do it, but do you want to do it? Are you willing to do it? How do you test the willingness, the confidence, the self-efficacy, the, you know, the intrinsic motivation to do something? That's never uh, you know, tested. So it really, this is gonna be a long conversation, it takes probably multiple graduate student courses to explore this. But what I would say is that really, it depends on your purpose. You know, I'm uh, generally against using any standardized testing to judge students because they do not judge the uniqueness of students. They can only measure what the test makers want to measure. And I think they, they measure much less and they miss much more in terms of our students. Thank you. So we had this, uh, this weird glitch when we first started, just so everyone's aware, um, where for some reason, um, about a dozen people, um, name was listed as Jan Morrison. So I'm not sure if this question is actually coming from the real Jan Morrison or one of those incorrect Jan Morrison. So I'll just ask it um, because it is by far the, the, the most upvoted question. Um, and A, Jan Morrison uh, asked this question, all this talk about device and internet access, but we have a large number of students without access. How do we address the systemic equity issue and the broadening gap between those with access and those without? Thank you, uh, Jim Morrison or whoever uh, that group is. Uh, again, it's a great question. So I have, um, th there are many, diff many different answers to do this, okay. You know, one simple quick answer is that social equity, you know, we got to bring this device, make sure there's no digital divide, at least in terms of hardware, you know. But I'm more, um, 
a pragmatist, you know, I, I like to be practical is to say, for all of us, we need to think about, we wear many different hats. I think as policy advocates, we definitely should go out there to advocate equal access to technology. And if those students don't have access, I think uh, uh, like many countries, many districts have, have done, you know, they are trying to bring access to the students and there's actually a pandemic highlighted the need of those and you know, charitable organizations, technology companies have been buying, have been sending devices to schools, to, to, uh, to families. And uh, so that, that's one thing. But to me, uh, I, I was okay. Uh, there are two issues here. One is that uh, let's, not, let's not try to devise a plan that solves everyone's problem. I doubt that's going to happen. You know, one, one thing I, I've been writing a lot about is that there's no one policy solution that works for everybody equally uh, well. Uh, and uh, so we need to think about uh, different policies for different populations. Uh, you know, I, I hope you do not you know, believe that I'm trying to uh, ignore the, the equity issue. I'm from among the best, I'm among the most kind of fierce advocates for equity issues. So that's not that those questions, because some children don't have access, let's ignore the students who have access. And so that, that's one way to do it. Another way to think about is that for those children who don't have access to the internet, to these devices, let's try to get them as much as possible. But if they don't, what should we do? That's another, that's another issue. It's, I know like people, you know, on a policy level, we are always ask, let's get better teachers, better technology. But I say, okay, as we speak, they don't. And we cannot, you know, uh, risk wasting another generation of people. We need to think about different ways to connect with the students. We send, uh, you know, books there. We send uh, packets of, of, of work there. We have them maybe encourage and write letters in traditional way to others to come and stay connected. Remember, we still have a post office that needs your support, you know, writing postcards, uh, creating really those postcards tell stories, we used to have pen pals, you know, I think we still have those technology available. So let's think about, yes, let's get them access, but if they don't, let's work something that work for those children too. Um, so I'd like to ask, I think, just one more question kind of about the now, um, and then I'd like to, to shift into um, uh, what are the lessons that we can be taking from now to, to address kind of schooling in general? So this question is from uh, Karen Kinsman. And Karen, if you are uh, there, I'm going to make you available to talk um, about virtual learning, virtual summer camps, and things of that nature. Karen, are you there with us? I am here. Hi, Karen. Hey. So I'm just curious. We're, we're having lots of conversations um, within our uh, department at UNM, um, which houses a couple of different um, kinds of pipeline programs, um, you know, about the shifts that we're making to virtual platforms um, to offer programs that have generally in the past been in-person programs, um, and considering, you know, figuring out how to make that either something we can pivot to quickly or, um, you know, innovating to the point where that virtual platform in a synchronous or asynchronous way um, is the way we move forward. But the concern in New Mexico, and I'm sure many other states, is that we have so many students, um, even now trying to transition to doing their own public education at home, um, who either don't have access at all because they're, you know, in, in a poverty situation or in a rural situation where just connectivity physically is not present. Um, or they're just, they're students who don't have um, the technology to connect. And, and that perpetuates inequities that we know are, are part of the system. So if we're looking at what Dr. Zhao is saying in terms of, um, you know, embracing um, the digital world and helping our students um, develop agency around their own educations and learnings and being um, good digital citizens. How do we do that for students who don't have access or whose access is very spotty? Thanks, Karen. I, I know, uh, well, it is definitely challenging. And uh, I would like to say this is to say, okay, um, 
there are different ways to connect. And uh, um, one is that uh, we used to have uh, conference calls. I think phones still work. I'm not sure, you know, without being living in a digital age, they can actually try to learn those skills. You know, let's be very uh, honest with that. If they're not online, if they're not doing social media, however, to reach them, to give them a sense of a community, I think uh, that, that you can do still assemble quite a good ecosystem of different medium uh, in terms of learning. And uh, we used to mail, you know, uh, tapes to people, video tapes, and China, yeah, you know, in order to reach this very remote areas, China used TV broadcasting uh, combined with phone calls. Actually, the phone calls are very helpful sometimes. And you may not have to, uh, to get distracted uh, in terms of a uh, sensor. And then, you know, ecosystem, you think about asynchronous, you know, uh, and uh, also you can leave voicemail, you know, all this. I'm mean, assuming there's nothing, you know, just, you know. And, but if you had email, you had uh, uh, a simple chat, you know, I think in the 1990s, we had those IRC chats, you know, all those things. I think what's important is to say, okay, to gather all our people together, not to wish what we had, but to say what we have. I think that's, that's another thing is that uh, we have a lot of times we have the bootstrapping. This may be a time to get uh, all the faculty and teachers to become quite innovative actually to say, okay, what we have, what we can do with what we have. And until this new thing uh, arrives, let's deal with it. I think, I, th I think there are many different ways to do this. Remember distance education is, has been there for a long time. But I think you, your question is to the, okay, how do we help them with the digital uh, world, digital competency? And that is tough because you're not digital, you don't have that, you know, and then let's try to resolve that, try to bring the uh, connection there, try to access there. And uh, definitely you raise a very interesting issue. Again, as uh, I was saying, there's no one solution that's going to work for all populations. Thank you. Um, I'd like to um, ask uh, Dr. Ask his question to kind of shift us over to uh, this uh, conversation of um, uh, I think I just cut out a second, but I think I'm back now. This conversation about how what are the lessons that we can learn now? So um, as we as we think about that, as we think about um, the experiences that we're taking now and how when we're back in you know quote more traditional use these lessons moving forward. Um, Dr. Reina, I'm going to try to redo my microphone a second. If you could go ahead and ask your question, are you there with us? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Great, great. Uh, thank you for everything you all do to uh, keep us um, engaged with, uh, you know, the things that we're dealing with. Um, Dr. Shaw, I, I guess um, um, I had a, a couple of things, but one of them is um, in uh, many, um, I guess, spheres, uh, one of the things that uh, is, uh, I guess, understood to a certain extent is that only economics will force a change in our educational system, i.e., let's say we fall behind the rest of the world, which uh, you know definitely is is happening in many ways, uh, to a point where we finally realize that we're going to have to change the way we're doing things because it would not otherwise be a strong enough, um, I guess, uh, force to really bring about the change that you're talking about or other changes that we may not even have thought about yet. Um, what would you, um, you know, say about that? Because right now, for example, obviously we're, we're in dire uh, need as far as uh, the economics of our communities. And so um, it's not a time when people are going to, you know, want to change things. And at the same time, um, you know, we are going to eventually be impacted, you know, because of the fact that we're falling behind. That's one thing. The other question, which kind of is interesting to me, too, is, um, uh, if you have children or if you have nephews or nieces, what are you doing for them knowing what you know and what you can do today? Just two, two, two interesting questions. Uh, thanks, Dr. Reina. I, I, you're right. I mean, you know, finance, economics will change. And I think that what might happen, um, globally speaking, schools may have to rethink about their budget. And, and that's another thing. We have not done much. You know, we've been advocating these new changes, these new, new, new initiatives, and uh, schools only, most schools do it because they have a, a, a received a grant, some kind of external money. I've been advocating that uh, if you want a real change, you should spend money on it. And that money shouldn't come as extra. You need to organize. Uh, I don't know how many schools have really 
seriously thought about their uh, their budget proactively to say if we want to do this if we want to add this what shall we take away this of course affects you know personnel affects the school buildings affects all those things can we think of could we do more of this spend less on this spend more on this you know schools some by and large have been forced to change you know think about no child left behind We've been adding a lot of reading specialists, you know. We've been adding a lot of, you know, uh, you know, testing people in our central offices, data people. We're removing some teachers. We've been reducing arts. We've been reducing. We've been we've been doing those things, but that's forced rent more by the law, you know, by law. But you know, in terms of innovation, we really haven't done much. I think we, we will face, given the economic downturn, uh, uh, some budget uh, crunches there, and maybe the new way of doing things maybe reactivate all the investment that we've done in some schools, you know, technology, and maybe there's a way to, there's a cost saving uh, behind it, you know. I think it's a lot of times, you know, as school districts, as school, you know, leaders, as teachers, we can rethink really about how do we, under tough times, we might become more creative in spending our money doing the right education. And also there's a lot of uh, uh, schools have already been starting thinking about you know, do they have to offer certain things the traditional way? You know, I think I would hope to see a lot more schools collaborating. I don't know how the, you know, the, the, the STEM ecosystem works, you know, but you know, the, there's a, a lot of people talking about cross-district collaboration. Can we have a online global consortium to share courses together? You know, students can take courses from other places. And can you really think about your teachers offering courses to uh, students in other countries, in other locations, collaboration? So that's really, I think, you know, uh, I don't have a right answer, but the answer is that under certain restricted budget, uh, economic downturns, it's very possible that we might be forced to be more creative with our spending. You know, that, that's, uh, and also it's a good idea, I can to re-examine, do we spend the money on what we mean? Do we spend money on what matters? And how do we rethink that process? Yeah, you know, I, I have two children, uh, but they're all grown ups now. One actually is in the epicenter in New York City, and uh, she was going to come home, but she did not want to kill us, you know. And uh, so then she, she decided to stay in New York and the city in quarantine. She just uh, she just finished her college, and uh, she uh, she just lost her job, you know, because she was working the in hospitality industry. So she was learning a tough lesson. I, I'm really happy she's learning the lesson and hang out with the others. Uh, my son is, uh, uh, is studying, he's doing his uh, PhD at, uh, in, uh, in, in, at Stanford, he's finished up dissertation. And after he has to go uh, uh, offline writing, all this stuff. So they're all uh, away, but we just kept talking with each other. We try to think about implications, we try to think about what this means. And uh, I don't have any young people, young children. And so, I'm hanging out in Oregon and uh, it's good, but thank you. I hope you guys are all okay, but thanks for that question. So something that, that you may have already picked up, but, but uh, good to know about our audience is um, the, the folks listening really love kind of practical things. How do we actually address this right now? And the, the exciting thing I, I think about um, this group is the, the way it's structured and the, there are these STEM ecosystems, 89 of them if you're new, uh, those of you listening to, to the concept, you can go to stemecosystems.org and learn a little more. There are 89 of these things around the world and they bring together all these different groups, which means that there's a lot of um, power not only in solving these problems together, but in connections to um, uh, lawmakers, policymakers uh, around the country, around the world um, that can help make change. And so I think this is uh, this time right now is a really exciting opportunity for everyone listening to, to really make our voices heard and make sure that um, the, the folks that lead our education initiatives, both nationally, internationally, at the state level, locally, uh, know that, that we think um, this change has to happen, that if we want our kids to be ready for um, the kind of economies that um, Dr. Zhao talks about, um, that we've got to make this change. I'm really excited. I get uh, inordinately excited when so one of my real life friends um, asks, a, asks a question. And uh, so I'd like to go to Toby Fisher. Toby is a principal in the Reynoldsburg School District in, um, down in, um, uh, near Columbus. Um, Toby, you had a really good question about portfolios and things and one of those practical questions. Are you there with us? Absolutely. Can you hear me? We hear you. Good. Um, portfolios are a passion of mine. Um, I've been really looking into doing these in a system for years. And the problem I run into is helping the educators. And when I say educators, I'm meaning the administrators first because they need to learn. And then the teachers, how do we help them 
understand that movement and do it in a quick way. Um, and I agree, this is a great opportunity. So how do we take advantage of this opportunity and run right now versus walk into these portfolio-based assessments as a way to get rid of the um, standardized assessments we all complain about frequently? Well, well Toby, I, th I think uh, th that's, um, that's actually a very nice, beautiful question to, to think about. I I'm sure in, out of the 200 some people here, a lot of you have different uh, suggestions for you as well. Some people have done this. Uh, I, I got uh, several suggestions. Number one, uh, when I talk portfolio, I talk about authentic uh, products, you know, or authentic things. And uh, I think we need to define some quality of that. That is, you know, does it solve a real problem? And how high quality is? Has it gone through different uh, revisions in the quality of that? And uh, and the UK engage in peer review is a, a good a good example. Self evaluation. The second thing, actually, I want to come to the educators. And educators, in think we have to invite all of educators to rethink about why do we evaluate? Why do we need a grade? And a lot of times, I, I remember Nanji's question about summative. By the way, when you give a summative. Uh, um, score, whatever that is, that's the best way to stop learning. Because children, once they're evaluated, they're done. If we think all evaluation is supposed to help people learn, there's really no ending. Actually, I give all students A's in my writing because I expect A kind of work. But until they're A, they cannot turn in. I mean, they, they get rejected. You know, so that's why, you know, the, the book recently that published called, uh, you know, An Education Crisis is a Terrible Thing to Waste. It's actually a lot of my students' work in, in, my, in my class teaching. He said, well, uh, it's PhD, a doctor level course, unless it's published book, it's not an A. So I think, you know, you, you, I think we need to have that expectation. I know that may, may, again, you know, go against the traditional, you know, bell curve, I know, talk about great inflation. But if we expect everybody to be great, like we expect every doctor to be great, you don't want a C doctor to operate on you. You know, you want a, a, a doctor. If we expect all of the competency, it's just really either you have the competency or don't have it for that moment. So I think, you know, I would simplify, but, but also the last point is, uh, this is um, going to take some time, but I would invite educators to think about, you know, the so-called assessment is actually learning. So learning is assessment, assessment is learning. Like now when we're talking to each other, you know, back and forth, I'm giving you feedback, you're giving me feedback, and that's assessing, but that's learning. You know, say, so, well, I don't know how that works. You know, maybe that's not like that. That's assessing and learning. You're assessing the hypothesis, you're getting feedback. So, so I think it's a really different way of rethinking uh, about the whole idea. So let's keep in mind, why do we test? You know, testing for a long time, the so-called standardized testing was to help the establishment to select students. So we didn't know what to do with diversity. So we used testing to put them into special ed, into gifted education, for retention, for remediation. You know, then we sort them in the end for using GPS. They can go to a better college or worse college or not going to college. We use test scores to define people, to divide people. And why do we need that? If we're really about learning, you know, the, the whole thing. And then if we go back to question, is what I'm trying to teach is, you, is even worth teaching for everybody? That's another question, you know. Do, how do we have the guts to say, what I want to teach you is absolutely valuable to you? Who is there to say? Who has the right to determine that? You know, that, that's another thing. I think, you know, people asking, you know, what if our kids fall behind? You know, now they are home for two months and they're going back to fourth grade. And so, what falling behind of what? You know, and teachers should adjust that anyway based on students' interests. But you know, every the so-called curriculum is not divine. You know, it's so that's what I think I want to think about assessment, the purpose, the risk. If we truly live with ideal, my idea of education is to help everyone become the best who they can be, self-actualization, and using their best of them to help others. And through helping others, they become even better. So that's why in my plan of education, to me, assessment is learning. Learning requires assessment, which in turn become what I call feedback. Uh, we'd like to go to Nancy Jones next. Nancy, uh, if you're there with us, Nancy has a, a really good question about kind of first steps when you're from the ground. Nancy, are you there with us? Uh 
Try one more time. Hello? There you are. Okay, hi. Hi, Nancy. Hi, how are you? We're doing well. Oh, my question was, um, as a retired CMSD school teacher, I would like to know how, the, the key to me is to convince leadership. I think a lot of teachers already believe in what the professor is saying in terms of, you know, you know, redoing school, reimagining school, but we have to follow the leadership. So how do you convince the leadership of the various school districts to implement the policies that the professor is promoting here? Yeah, I think that's a, a really great question, Nancy. I think that um, uh, we, we run into this issue, right, where the people on the ground know we need to change. We have leaders whose hearts are all in the right place if you're, if you're on the, the phone with us right now uh, or on the, the show with us right now, but, um, but have all these other things that they feel kind of beholden to. So how, uh, Dr. Shaw, how do we, how do we get them to, to feel this same urgency? Well, Nancy, thank you. I, I, I think, you know, you just heard from Toby asking a question, how do you convince teachers? So we have this uh, interesting yeah, game of saying, uh, the principal saying the school leader says, well, the teacher is not coming along. Teachers saying the, the leaders are not coming along. You might just be in the wrong districts. I, I, I think that that might happen, you know. <laughs> you have the great leader in a different district, a great, you know, great teacher in another district. My view is this, is that um, there are many programs, many people trying to change leaders, change teachers. But for individually, practically, you know, I think you, 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 you may just have to choose. Uh, you have to take actions. I always emphasize the action we can take on our own. I don't think, you know, uh, you know I try to convince, everybody's trying to convince leaders and teachers. We, we should do that all the time. This for, not forget that we are doing that. We should be doing that. But at the same time, practically, we, you know, we only live for so many years. We only have so much energy. While we try to convince others, we shall take action. We cannot wait for others to change. We are part of the change. Let's do as much as we can. I think I believe everybody, every teacher, every student, every parent, every school leader who wishes to change has enough room to change. That room may not be big enough, but we can always change ourselves. And our change could have ripple effect into others. So yes, let's argue, let's try, let's convince. But at the same time, let's take actions. And this is why actually the, the book, the, the whole book called, uh, you know, an education crisis is a terrible thing to waste. We wrote last year, we did not anticipate this crisis. That was a book documenting how examples of student, individual teachers, no matter what districts they are, school principals, they can all change. I wish for system changes, but I have to admit, systems don't change by themselves. We are part of the system. We need to take action. And I said, thank you. You're retired, you're still actively participating. You are leading the change, you know? And we have so many stories about how individuals can bring down large systems, but that individual has to be brief, has to take action. Most of system changes were accidental, really. Not, not you know, because people who are benefiting from the existing system typically have no interest in destroying the system on their own. And so we need to, create options, create alternatives, and make it small and gradual and they will link. And look at the power of them, you know, the, you know honestly, the, your ecosystem. How many people we have joined? Today, we've got 100, 200 people. Who knows, out of 200 people, maybe two people will take action, and that two will become four in all those kind of things. So those things can, can happen, they can change. And let me actually type in my, 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 web, my web address so you can get a sense to say, uh, to check out my website just in case if you want to get in touch, you want to follow. And uh, so, yes, go ahead. So, yeah, and we'll also send that address out to, to everybody in our, in our follow-up along with the recording of this message. Um, I think we have time for one last question before we close. And I'd like to uh, throw that to uh, Lisa Blank, um, who I'm unmuting right now, um, who has a, a one final question kind of bringing us back to the practical of, of right now of addressing the needs of student learners right now. Lisa, are you there with us? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's been really interesting because I'm working really closely with a lot of teachers and I'm hearing stories from the field. I've heard stories of teachers having lessons in what we're calling crisis education um, because some 
don't, there's concern over the quality of it in calling it real remote learning or online learning. So in crisis education, we have teachers that have students show up for two days and then not show up again um, in the online environment. We have other teachers who are playing games with kids and they're having lots of fun connecting you know, on that social emotional level, which is very important. And I don't mean to you know, slight that at all because I feel like in these times that's very important. But I've been very curious about remote learning models and and how to assess the quality. What are we looking for? How can we help teachers ensure that they are creating a quality online learning model that engages students and is highly effective? We have good models for things. You know, I think about the pair model that we use, the dimensions of success for out of school time learning and STEM engagement. What can we look to to help guide us and help support our teachers in this regard? Um, so that we can continue down a path that's as effective as it can be in spite of our crisis time. Well, thanks, Lisa. Uh, I've written several blogs on my website about online education, but uh, let me just uh, say this, is that uh, we did a research years ago about um, distance learning. Uh, first of all, it actually truly varies based on age group, technology use, platform use, and the content you try to, uh, uh, the outcomes you try to achieve. So um, what I we found interesting, what I definitely useful is uh, synchronous interactions are quite important uh, and peer supporting, peer interaction will be important. I think right now we have a lot of schools, uh, teachers trying to uh, identify, trying to connect with every student and students, some come on, come go off, and peers are very important to connect that, maintain that, peer bonding, peer relationship, and assign distributed um, uh, work. Kids have to work together uh, across uh, uh, locations, different places, and those are interesting things to do, but also, you know, uh, I would try to say, minimize online on screen time. Uh, you know, for, this is my new suggestion and minimize that. And uh, it's very hard to lecture to so many people. I'm surprised today. Actually, I can keep you guys for so long. This is uh, very shocking. And uh, you know, another thing is that uh, students creating things, using the media, that's another part which students seldom get a chance to do. You know, we, we, don't, we don't have them to do a lot of productive things. So students collaboration. Uh, so to have given them more work to do, Rather than, you know, this is typical our PBL stuff, your model is that, you know, students engage in the authentic work that can be done by themselves and collaboratively and less instruction. So this really goes to the entire new model of education. It's called, you know, inquiry based. You know, we serve as facilitators, not lecturers. Thank you, Dr. Zhao. I do want to ask you go, one last question. I'm probably going to get in trouble for going a minute over, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, what are you excited for or hopeful for with everything that's going on right now? Um, what is the, 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 the ray of sunshine that comes through all of this that, that you're really excited for? Well, thanks, Jeremy. You see my background called silver lining for learning. And there is a silver lining somewhere. We, we just started a new talk show uh, on YouTube. You know, let me do some commercial here. 5.30 to 6.30 with people like Christine of Harvard, Punya Mishra of uh, Arizona State. Scott McLeod from Colorado and Kurt Bunk from Indiana University. We do a weekly show uh, bringing guests from all over the world, really. So who are, how they're inventing education. So what I think I'm very hopeful, I've never seen this. Suddenly, overnight, educators began to have conversations across the globe. This is actually, that has not happened. This is, you know, this is happening now. I hope we can reach out to people who don't speak English. Well, I hope we can reach other countries. I really hope we have a global education movement. I hope we will recognize we are not, you know, uh, Oregonians, Americans, Ohioans, you know, we are many citizens of the globe and our children need to understand that very well. So this gives me great hope, the silver lining. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Jai. I, th I think this is our chance. This is the chance of this generation to have something that brings us all together. Um, and I encourage all of you to not only continue uh, joining us here um, twice a week, but also to, to listen to Dr. Zhao's show um, and read his books, um, because this is our opportunity to, to bring the world together to really think about and address some of those, um, those big grand challenges. This has been STEM Community Conversations from STEM at Home, brought to you by the STEM Learning Ecosystems Community of Practice. Thank you for joining us today for Don't Let a Crisis Go to Waste, a conversation with Dr. Yang Zhao. Thank you, Dr. Zhao. These community conversations will revolve around successful models and new ideas to support STEM learning experiences during and beyond this time of social distancing. Stay tuned to stemecosystems.org for upcoming shows, and please continue to participate. I'm Jeremy Shore, and we will see you next time. Thank you.